Well, two birds, two bets, and of course, crazy people. Hey, before we get going on our little video here, I just want to take one second and I want to thank all of the folks that have subscribed recently. There has been a big infusion of new folks that have decided to go ahead and join me here and become a member of the Old Dog family. So I just want you to know that you are appreciated, as well as those that have been with me for years and possibly since day one. Thank you all very, very much. It means a lot to me. Um, this video is going to be a reflection of the seven years that I've been living here in sleepy little Dumaguete. And I promise you, there has been a ton of changes that have taken place. I'm going to go over what it was like in the beginning when I first got here, the differences in relationships, the differences in financial situations, the differences in just the town in general. Uh, Dumaguete, for some reason, has been in the press a lot recently. And I thought it would be fun if I just took a moment and went down memory lane and took you along with me as I recall what it was like uh, when I first got here and how big a difference there is in not just my life, but in the entire city of Dumaguete. Uh, the changes that have taken place, some of the negatives, some are positives. I'll let you be the judge. All right, so coming up right now is my little video about seven years of living in Dumaguete. All righty then, so 2017 is when I arrived in Dumaguete. And I must tell you, it was a much different place. And it had a much different vibe to it than it does today. So we'll go take a walk down memory lane. And it took me a little while to remember some of the nuances, but I'm going to go ahead and share them with you. And it's kind of funny because <laughs> even though as I sit here today and I am, I, I must confess, I'm 100% satisfied with my station in life right now, I still kind of long for the good old days of 2017. <laughs> there was just something sort of magical about it. And I don't think it'll ever repeat itself, at least not here in Dumaguete. But oh well, here we go. Um, I think one of the most noticeable things that was small on the surface, but had a huge impact on me, was wherever I went, mainly if I was driving my scooter, or if I was just walking down the street, or going through the mall, people would stare at me especially little kids, because, um, you know, kids, they don't have any inhibitions. So they'll just stare at you. And sometimes their mothers or fathers would say, hey, stop doing that. But as I drove down the street, for example, people would stop and just look at you. Um, and if I waved at them, they would wave right back with a big, great big grin on their face. And they were just so welcoming. And they were just kind of like, wow, who is this guy? What is this? This is so new and unusual. And um, I don't know, maybe it was a status thing that I felt. And it just made me feel good. Um, probably ego, to be candid with you. Because where I, when I was back home in America, I was the invisible man. I was just another old codger, bumbling through the day getting in people's way and taking up their parking space. <laughs> they wanted nothing to do with me. <laughs> and so they couldn't wait for me to die. <laughs> and so when I came over here, though, there was just two things that I noticed were revered. And that was the fact that I looked different. And the fact, I guess because my hair is, is white, it's so different looking than the jet black hair that everybody over here has. But there was also this appreciation and respect for age. And that still it permeates the society today. Um, that hasn't changed any. And, of course, I felt the opposite back home. That the older I got, I was kind of more useless or worthless 
or I'd been used up and I was really not producing anything for anybody anymore. Again, I was just taking up space. But here, for some reason, people had this little fascination with me because, and anybody else that looked like me, because of our look. And it was different. Um, back in 2017, 18, 19 even, um, we can go a couple of years. All of this is relevant for those first two years. Dumaghetti was really a lot smaller than it is now. Um, there were the, the, big, the big place, the biggest, easiest place to find was Robinson's Mall as far as conveniences or anything modern. And that's been expanded since. But never mind. Back then, it was what it was. And it was a small mall compared to what you're used to. But that was where you could go and you could walk through the mall and you betcha, you would be looked at talked about, whispered about, and it wasn't just me, it was everybody. Um, it was, I used to people watch, one of my favorite, favorite things to do, and I don't do it anymore, but there was a coffee shop named Bo's Coffee, and it was just outside of the aforementioned Robinson's Mall. And I would go there, and I would get my favorite hot beverage, and yes, I would smoke a cigarette, but I would be outside and I would sit there for a couple of hours and I would just watch people. And I would of course admire the pretty ladies that were walking by and I would also observe the foreigners. And the foreigners had two things in common. I would say 85% of them were two things. They were old and they were fat. <laughs> and I was right in there with them. <laughs> old fat foreigner and <laughs> the other thing that always made a crazy visual in my head was that there was just a ton of single available females that these guys were with and it made for to this day if I was I don't see it that often now but back then I would see these little skinny you know, 75 pound, five foot two, uh, beautiful Filipinas, dressed with little mini skirts or whatever, holding the hand of this big fat guy that was six foot two, and he weighed you no know, less than 300, and just dolting on him. And I would look at it, and I would just scratch my head, and I would say, it just, it just doesn't look right. <laughs> And so, but it was, it was, again, it was enlightening, it was fun. And my own experience with the ladies was very similar to the other guys. We would meet people, it seemed to be that the women back then were simply a lot more aggressive. Um, they were, I don't know how to put it, they were just, they would act friendly, they would give you kind of a look, they would sort of give you a smile, and so I was never much of a ladies man where I could just walk up and start yapping them. In fact, I've never done that since I've been here. But when I did sit down and chat with somebody, it was very easy to get acquainted with them and get familiar with them. And I would see a young lady she would be in her 20s, I was in my 60s, and we might go out for a while because she would express an interest, and of course she was gorgeous, so me being me, I would say, sure, why not? And we would see each other for a few days, and then no matter what, um, I just knew it wasn't gonna work because of such a huge age gap. We had nothing in common. Um, when I did get together with somebody, it was generally somebody in their late 20s or early 30s. We would date for, you know, three or four weeks. And I noticed my friends were having the same experience. They were dating for two, three, four weeks um, and then calling it a day and just saying, no, no more. 
goodbye, I can't take this any longer. And when we would have our informal conferences with one another um, that weren't planned, but we would have, and I would say, hey, what's up with Betty, you know? Or I'd ask another guy, hey, what's up with Sally? And the guy would ask me, hey, whatever happened to that Mary girl? She sure was cute. And you know what? We all had the same answer. It was, dude, I couldn't breathe. They were so clingy and they didn't want to let me out of their sights and they were hanging on for dear life and it was um, it was all this smothering and jealousy and wanting to check your phone and then making these weird accusations and you go through that for a couple of years <laughs> and it gets old in a hurry and I knew a number of guys that they said you know what well, they didn't say, you know what, but they would, they would meet somebody and they'd say, oh, I think this is the one. This girl is really something else. And after six months, poof, she'd be gone. And I'd be like, dude, she was gorgeous. She was sweet. She was, you know, taking good care of you. She was nice. What happened? Well, it was one of two things. Number one, the good old jealousy, the clinginess that they couldn't go anywhere without her going with you just this huge insecurity factor that was just running rampant. And I think it's because there was such a, there was more women than men here back in the day. And, or it became a money grab. Uh, they would start to come up with problems. You've heard it a thousand times. I won't dwell on it. But, you know, mom needed money. She needed money. This was going wrong. That was going wrong. And they got tired of that. And that wasn't all the time, but it would happen. But the clinginess and the insecurity and the jealousy would drive all of us just frickin' loopy. And so that was the primary um, illusion that I have or, or, or memory that I have of those first two years here in the Philippines is just it. The whole population was old, and I'm talking about expats, all had beer bellies, with, for the exception of about 10 or 15 percent of guys that you know, went to the gym and did the right thing. Um, the women were, seemed to be much more aggressive, they seemed to be much younger, and um, the guys, even though they were with them, they just got to a point to where they would snap. And they would say, I just can't take this anymore. Um, so that would be, um, and I'm going to fast forward to what it's like now. But while I'm still in those years, so I'm going to say 2017 to 2019, this town, while it was small, it was also, majority of it was motorcycles. You very rarely saw an automobile, let's well, say rarely, you would see a car, uh, you would see a truck. They have big jeepneys and public transportation, of course, but as far as personal vehicles, it was damn near everybody had a motorcycle or a motorbike. And so it was a lot easier to navigate. Parking wasn't that big of a deal. Um, there were some major restaurants down on Rizal Boulevard, uh, but nothing like there is today. So back then, everything was a lot cheaper also. You could find for 200 bucks a decent little apartment, maybe 250. Um, back then, um, a pack of cigarettes would cost less than a dollar. Um, now there are more than three. Uh, back then, there was a few places that the professional drinkers would go to and hang out and drink because the beers were 25 to 30 pesos a piece. If they went into an air-conditioned resto bar, they might go up five pesos to help pay for the air conditioning and get a meal. Breakfast was a couple of bucks. You get my drift. We were getting less money back then. I was simply because my Social Security check was less than it is today. Also, the exchange rate back then 
was about eight or nine points lower than it is now. So I had less money coming in. I had less money, I had less buying power as far as the exchange rate, but it didn't matter. It was all a wash because all things being equal, I can pretty much say even though there's been a lot of inflation recently here in the Philippines in the last year, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, the COLA increases and the exchange rate really has not affected the budget that much. Um, I know that Dumaguete has had some negative press in the last 30 days or so. And I just want to go on record and say that I think that if you go to any town USA, any town Philippines, you're going to have some kind of commotion, some kind of disruption. For some reason, there's just this plethora of YouTubers out here in Dumaguete. Why? I don't know. More than any other city as far as I know in the Philippines. And everybody's doing pretty much the same video about the same thing for a while. And then other channels are doing videos about the videos. <sighs> and hopefully that's all past. I never got into the weeds on it. I never will. But I wanted to acknowledge it. And I just want to say that my life here has been exceptionally boring and free of any kind of violence or drama or confrontations. If I meet somebody that I don't care for, eh, I just walk away and leave it at that and never get, never let it get under my, be under my bonnet. I just move on. And without insulting the person before I leave, I just, you know, walk. Anyway, um, what happened then in 2020? The pandemic. And that puppy lasted for two years. During the pandemic, there was an exodus of expats, a.k.a. foreigners. The reason why is they didn't want to leave the Philippines. Um, I'll back up a little bit. Prior to the pandemic, you could come over here. I came over here and did it on a tourist visa. And without getting into all the details, you could live here for three years. And then it was time for you to start all over again. And what you did was you would book a flight. You would go out of the country for at least 24 hours. You could book the flight six months in advance. It only cost you maybe a hundred bucks round trip. You could go to Singapore or, or whatever was close, whatever was around. It doesn't matter where you went. You went out of the country. You landed. You might get a hotel for the evening. You might just hang out in the airport <laughs> until the day changed. I knew a guy that did that. And anyway, you would fly back into the country and you would start your three years all over again. Well, the pandemic really put the kibosh on guys being able to do that because you could leave the Philippines once the pandemic was in full force. You could leave. If a country would accept you, you could bug out. You could go to Mexico. You could probably get into the United States if you were a citizen. Um, I forget all the rules and regulations. But guys had to leave for a number of reasons. Number one, they needed to get home and take care of business because they left every year anyway. Or they had to go because their visas were expiring and they didn't want to be in trouble. They didn't want to overstay their visa. And there was no real exceptions or fixes for that, that at least that I'm aware of. Um, I got super lucky because I had just come back into the country. I had gone to, I believe, it was either Vietnam or Indonesia. Vietnam. And I had just come back from Vietnam when the pandemic hit. So I had three years left on mine. Pandemic lasted two. So I was still cool. But other guys weren't as lucky. They had six months. They had a year. That came. They had to go. Other guys had obligations, taxes to do, businesses to run, homes to upkeep, kids to go visit, parents that may have died. You name it, uh, just personal stuff that they had to handle back at home, be it personal or business or combination of the two. And then they couldn't get back in. And they were 
pissed and they were frustrated. And so a lot of them went back to wherever they came from, be it the United States or Norway or whatever, and take care of their deal. And then they would come back to another country like Mexico and somewhere else that was really friendly at the time. I forget where it was, Nicaragua. And they would just hang out there, um, kind of waiting out the pandemic um, for the Philippines to open. Wouldn't you know, the Philippines was the last to open of all the Asian countries, the last one. And when they did open, you paid the price to come in. You had to have all these requirements and you had to go through a quarantine period and God forbid you should test positive. You were penalized on top of penalization and it was just an ugly scene. I don't really want to talk about it. What happened to the Philippines while I was here during the pandemic? Well, masks were required, of course. Moving around was limited. Um, you all experienced it. I know we all want to put it in our rearview mirror and never see it again. But during that time, there was really just sort of a group depression that fell over the Philippines. I know I felt it. I could see that people felt it. Um, one thing that I used to feed off of, and I think a lot of people here would feed off of, was the smiles. Remember the little kids and like that? When I drove by, they would look at me and I would wave and they would smile. Yeah. Well, we weren't getting that positive feedback anymore. We were all feeling controlled. Over a million families, I did Google this, were bankrupted and forced into poverty because they lost their businesses. People left. Not only did the foreigners and the expats bail out of the Philippines, but a lot of the local people, including the women, went back to the province. They left and they went home, the mom and dad. There was no work here anymore. And if they didn't have a boyfriend or someone to support them, well, they were SOL. And so away they went. And then once the Philippines reopened again on February 10th of 2022, people started to come back in. However, I just saw a shift in a number of things. Number one, the plethora of women that were available back in 217 to 219 didn't materialize again. It's like they went to the province and stayed there. <laughs> it didn't, I don't see a lot of the younger women moving here. Now, I am an old married guy. So I'm not in that marketplace. I'm not out at night. I'm not out carousing. I'm not out doing anything. So I'm probably a little askew on that. But even during the day, if I was to sit down and have that cup of coffee and people watch for two hours, I am now seeing a different sight. And something that my wife brought up to me is that number one, the old fat, ugly expats, just like me, <laughs> are no longer, or well, I shouldn't say no longer because nothing's absolute, but the majority of the guys are um, attracted to and seeking and settling down with women that are much closer to their age, 40s, 50s. There's maybe a 10-year age gap, a 15, there's a 30-year age gap between myself and my wife. So that has been a shift that we have both noticed. The women are, are more average looking. They're just, they're low maintenance. They're sweet as can be. They're beautiful Filipinas. And this is what the mindset of the guys moving over here now just seems to have had a complete shift. Why? I don't know. Back in the day, we'll go back again to the old Wild West of 2017, 18, 19, the thought of getting married never crossed anybody's mind. In fact, it was frowned upon. It was like, dude, are you crazy? You're going to get married? Why the hell would you get married? There is, you know, if she gives you any, now you can't move on if you start to have a hard time with her. You're locked in. You're nailed down. 
you were married in the States, you got to be crazy. And that was pretty much the attitude. What my wife brought to my attention today, and she's absolutely right, a lot of the guys moving here right now are getting married, and they're getting married quickly. Me, <laughs> it only took five years. <laughs> I met May five years ago. We were together for four years, and we got married last year, so we had our one-year anniversary, and that makes us together five years married for one. Um, I'm a little bit of a uh, procrastinator. <laughs> I'm very pragmatic about my decisions. Anyway, but I'm seeing guys coming over here, meeting the love of their life, moving them in, marrying them, and now buying property, and this, that, and the other. And I think that's great. Um, it seems to be working. I used to think, my God, these guys are moving way too fast. I hope I'm wrong. I've always told people, slow down. Why, why are you rushing into such a big decision? I still say that. But to be quite candid with you, I haven't seen any big explosions. Maybe they're going to happen down the line. I don't know. The last thing I want to talk about is cars and traffic and expansion. The town has boomed. It has, since the pandemic is over, in fact, during the pandemic, they were doing a lot of construction. I know they weren't supposed to, but it's funny how that happened, how some big buildings managed to get erected while that was going on. Uh, there's more malls. There's, I don't know how many more eateries. I could, well, there was two sushi bars in, in Dumaguete that I knew of back in the day, the good old days of 2017 and 18. Now there's about 15, maybe 20 that you can go into. Um, hamburger stands, uh, just different, uh, much more expensive, more exclusive steaks. Um, the cuisine is different. The restaurants are getting more modern, bigger, air-conditioned, um, just catering to a different type of crowd than I'd ever seen before. There was no way in hell you would have a place that you see now today, two stories with bands and um, air conditioning and uniforms and um, the type of food that they're selling today. That was something you could only dream of back then. Now it's almost becoming standard fare. And the last thing I'm going to hit on is automobiles. Now, a lot of people like to blame, and I did. I said, whenever I saw a car driving by, and the cars have overtaken the bikes, and it's brutal. It has plugged up the city. It has plugged up, especially little downtown Dumaguete. Parking is a joke. So, I thought in the beginning that it's all these foreigners buying the, all these cars. Well, old Paulie boy was wrong. It's the majority and the vast majority of the cars being driven on the road, brand new cars, are Filipinos. And I'll tell you why. This happened um, three years ago, this phenomenon. Easy financing and a much larger Filipino middle class. Where the middle class came from, I don't know. But it wasn't here, it wasn't prevalent at least, when I first arrived. But post-pandemic years, 2021, no, I'm sorry, 2023, 2024, 2021, 22 rather, um, I started to see more and more and more affluent Filipinos dining at the aforementioned restaurants that I just mentioned. Um, there's resorts that the rooms are 200 bucks a night. The majority of the patrons there, Filipinos. The majority of the cars driving on the road are Filipinos. One thing that I know is why I'm right on that is that me, Paul, I can't go into a Toyota dealership or any dealership for that matter and finance a car. I have to pay cash. They will not finance me. They might finance my wife, but that could get hinky too. 
mean, if they did, I wouldn't sign the paperwork because the interest rates are so stupid high. But the Filipinos, I don't believe, are quite as savvy. I think they work a little bit more off of emotion and ego. And they've got this newfound wealth. And of course, like me, the American, back when I, in the day when I was their age, I wanted to show off and I wanted to be, you know, keeping up with the Joneses. So I see a lot of keeping up with the Joneses these days in the Philippines, and especially here in Dumaguete. Um, easy financing, and they can't drive for the dam. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. Um, that is that. I am seeing, in summary, um, my dollar goes a lot further today, but it's absorbed by 30 some odd percent inflation. Um, expats make up about 3% of the population here in Dumaguete. I don't think we're making that big of an impact on inflation or the price of land or the, price or the reason that so many people are buying cars because we're not a big enough group, we're not a big enough number. Um, and I'm including all nationalities in that 3%. So it's the Filipinos that are driving the economy. I applaud them for that. But it has changed. Um, I know a number of young guys that are out here. Now, a young guy back in the day, there were two or three that I knew. They were known as butterflies because they would just go from girl to girl to girl to girl to girl to girl to girl. No questions asked because they were young, they were good looking, and obviously a young good looking guy is a much better selection for a young Filipina than say yours truly here, right? This just to be honest with ourselves. So these guys, they just were, if that was their thing, they were called chick boys, they were called other names. But they didn't last. They would be here about 10, 11 months and I saw them come, I would see them burn through a bunch of cash, I would see them burn through a lot of females <laughs> and uh, cause uh, you know, their own little sets of problems with that and then they would go back to their home country, wherever that may have been. Right now there's a younger generation that's coming in as far as expats goes, many, many more guys in their 40s and they're finding it more and more complicated to meet somebody. And they're, I can see it, I know them personally. I know like five or six, two of them have YouTube channels. I talk to them every blue moon, say what's going on? And they are having a complicated, difficult time meeting somebody, which astounds me because they're young, they're good looking. Remember the butterflies that I talk about? Not happening now. Why is that happening? I don't have a clue. If you've got a clue, maybe you could leave it for me in the comments. Okay, I'll see you in the next video.